Elizabeth Johnson, and I am with the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture. And uh, thank you for joining our first SALT webinar here today. Um, SALT is um, also known as Seattle Arts Leadership Team. And we are a flexible and creative professional development program for artists and arts administrators. SALT combines the need for ongoing professional development with the creativity of the sector by bringing interesting, challenging, and thought-provoking workshops, networking, and training to Seattle's arts ecology. So um, today we have Cinnamon Stevens here um, to talk to us, and I'll do a proper bio for her in a second. But I wanted to let people know that you can, you'll have a chat box at the bottom of your screen that you can um, submit questions or comments. And um, Cinnamon will have a portion at the end of her presentation for people to ask questions. And I will attempt to unmute you and let you ask them, or you can ask them through the chat box. Um, Cinnamon Stevens is a lawyer based in Amsterdam whose practice focuses on art and intellectual property law. Ms. Stevens, a native of Seattle, received her BA in history with honors from Williams College and her GD from the University of Michigan Law School. Over the past decades, Ms. Stevens has represented a number of clients in the arts community, including visual artists, filmmakers, authors, musicians, a dance group, and galleries, among others. Ms. Stevens served on the boards of 911 Media Arts and Washington Lawyers for the Arts, as well as conducting seminars on art law at Cornish College of the Arts, the University of Washington, and for Washington Lawyers for the Arts Brown Bag Series. Thank you, Cinnamon, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Elishwa. I really appreciate this chance to uh, speak to everyone and to talk about one of my favorite subjects, uh, Total Soapbox. <laughs> uh, for the, and I, so thank you, Elishwa, and thank you for the, uh, to the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture. So we're going to be talking about copyright today. Uh, basically, what we're going to be discussing is copyright basics with a little bit of a discussion of some of the critiques of copyright that are made, um, largely because I see with my clients and with also social media and various articles, I see a lot of critiques of copyright. And sometimes I feel, well, no, largely I feel that uh, those critiques uh, get passed around without an actual understanding of what copyright entails, particularly in the US. This is probably going to be a little heavily biased towards visual artists, but a lot of it is applicable generally. Um, I'm going to say, uh, so I am tech and apt, just warning you. Um, but if there is a chat box, uh, what I would suggest is that if you have a question uh, that you feel would be a clarification, uh, for example, if you feel like I discussed something and you don't quite understand what I'm saying, please feel free to send me a question so I can clarify for the group. However, if you have something more specifically detailed, happy to take those questions. Um, uh, but it's better if you send them, send them to me and then I will address them later. Okay? So, beginning now. Uh, let's see. Again, remember, tech and apt. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, the overview is the basics of copyright. Uh, and then, again, because I feel like there are urban legends of copyright are very, very pervasive. And you find people discussing copyright issues and whether or not it makes sense for them as an artist. Uh, with When they discuss it, they re refer to things that aren't actually true. So what I'd like to start with is, Here's what it is, here's how it works, etc. And then we can get into some of the anti-copyright critiques. Uh, I feel that uh, I think it's important that you understand what the, uh, what's involved in copyright because that allows you to assess whether or not the critiques make sense to you. And this is important going forward for your practice as artists. Okay. First of all, Know your intellectual property. Uh, one of the things that you see quite a bit of is people eliding um, copyright with trademark, with trade secrets, with patents. So it is important to know, we're going to be addressing copyright today, but it is a good idea to have a sense of what is, what's involved with each. So for example, trademark. Trademark is a word, phrase, symbol, or design, or a combination of words, phrases, symbol, or design 
that identifies and distinguishes the source of goods of one party from those of another, um, including protected the classes. Uh, the thing about trademark is often you'll get a bit of confusion and sometimes copyright issues cross over with trademark because there can be overlap. Um, but essentially trademark is something that is generally commercially oriented. It also deals with, it's predominantly concerned with whether or not consumers are confused. Uh, that's the basic thing. It's like uh, why somebody cannot uh, come out with Coca-Cola versus Boca-Cola. Uh, essentially the idea is that a consumer should not be confused, so trademark protection is based on that. It's very different from copyright protection, even though there's occasionally overlap. Patent, uh, patent goes to uh, uh, new useful processes, article of manufacture, composition or matter, or any new useful improvement thereof. So uh, oftentimes you'll see that with software, there can again be overlap, but it's important to understand that certain processes uh, will not be copyrightable. So again, you need to know what you're actually dealing with. And finally, rights and publicity. We're going to go to copyright, but this is something that it's less frequently addressed than uh, the other IP in terms of trademark or patent. But rights and publicity become an issue for artists because occasionally you want to use, oops, uh, occasionally you want to use an image or a slogan or something that's related to a, an existing person. And depending on the state that's involved and where that person chooses to file suit or lives, you may have issues of, of them being able to deny you the ability to use something. I use an, a photograph, for example, based on not so much copyright, but actually their right in their name, image, likeness, or signature. So let's go to copyright. So what is it and how do you acquire it? Copyright protects original works of authorship that are fixed in a tangible form of expression. Uh, below is a list of the different categories that can be copyright, uh, copyrighted. This is important to notice because, again, uh, sometimes people will, something, will believe something's copyrightable, which actually would fall more properly into trademark. Um, the key with copyright is the original works of authorship, um, literary works, musical works, dramatic works, uh, choreography, uh, visual arts is number five, motion pictures, sound recordings, architectural works. So essentially, uh, included in the copyrightable works are compilations and derivations, uh, derivative works, which we'll get into a bit later. But essentially, uh, copyright covers these things. There are certain things that are not protected by copyright, and there's a considerable amount of confusion here because, again, you can have elements where they're protected by copyright and other elements of the works aren't protected by copyright. In terms of not protected by federal copyright, works that have not been fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So, for example, if you have a bit of choreography but you don't actually make notations or record how, or write down how it should go, that is not considered fixed in a tangible form of expression. Uh, again, going to trademark titles, names, short phrases, slogans. Uh, if you think of a great t-shirt slogan, that may be trademarkable, but that's not necessarily copyrightable, and in fact it probably is. Uh, let me just, before I switch uh, to the next subject, or next bit. Uh, are there any questions looking for clarification? Um, you have Monica Washington said, if you have time, could you later address how to properly copyright works for hire? Yes, we'll be addressing that. Um, and that's an excellent question because those do, that is a very important subject. Um, okay, so we'll be getting to that. Uh, let's see. Whoops.
Okay, one of the things to understand about copyright is we use this word copyright, but actually copyright is a collection of exclusive rights. It's not a single right. And this is important because it's better to think of copyright as a parcel of things that you as the creator have the right to control. Uh, you have the exclusive right to use that for commercial or whatever advantage, essentially. That's the underlying concept of copyright. So, however, it is, again, a collection of exclusive rights on a single right, and they can be, because it's a parcel of rights, uh, I'm going to describe uh, this federal statute ex uh, details which, uh, which rights are involved. But again, it's better to think of it as a parcel, because the thing is, and we'll discuss this a bit in a few minutes, these rights are transferable. So you can grant, uh, you can sell your right. Uh, you can you can sell a copyright, uh, like one of the rights under the copyright. You can uh, license it, so you can give somebody uh, permission to use your right, either exclusively or non-exclusively. But essentially, this it's a bundle of rights which can be divvied up. So the exclusive rights are uh, specified in 17 U.S.C. Section 106. First is to reproduce the work in copies or phonic records. This is one of the areas that you see predominantly. This is one of the biggest infringement areas. If you are the creator, you have the exclusive right to reproduce the work. So you can make, you can take your image and put it as, on as many t-shirts as you want to. That's your choice. However, somebody else, a third party, cannot do so. Unless, of course, you give them permission to do so. Uh, to prepare derivative works based on the work. Uh, essentially, if you want to make a variation on the work, then that's your exclusive right. Um, to distribute copies or phonorecords, I um, won't go into this in detail in this because it's beyond a bit beyond the scope, but if you have questions, please ask me. But essentially, uh, copies are... so. A copy isn't just a reproduction of the work, it, it's actually the physical representation of the work. Um, but essentially, your ability to either offer the original for sale or to offer copies of it, uh, whether it's, uh, it's a poster or it's an album, that's an exclusive right of the copyright holder. To perform the work publicly, uh, literary, musical, dramatic, and choreographic works. Again, this is an exclusive right of the the original author uh, to display the work publicly. Uh, again, so this is display versus perform. Uh, please ask if you're uh, hazy on the distinction, but it is two different things. Um, and then finally, with sound recordings, to be able to perform the work publicly by means of a digital audio transmission. Okay, again, so you have the exclusive rights. They are transferable. So a uh, key thing is that the ownership of a copyright may be transferred in whole or in part by any means or operation of law. This is technical language, but it's handy to have. Uh, it also can be passed by will, and it is considered personal property. Now this is an important thing because, uh, not to get too lawyery, but you have personal property, which would be things like your car, your jewelry, uh, et cetera, and you have real property, which is like your house. It's essentially real estate. Those are two distinct things. Copyright is considered personal property, and it is important to note that because it has implications in terms of taxes. It has implications in terms of uh, if you if you're preparing a will, which you all should do. Uh, but if you're preparing a will, uh, your intellectual property rights, particularly copyright, you need to deal with them in a different way than you would deal with other aspects of your of your estate. So just note. Um, uh, let's see. Although you do not need to file a, a transfer of ownership with the Copyright Office, and I'll talk a bit about that in a second, 
uh, why you would even do that. Um, it is important to know that a transfer of copyright ownership needs to be in writing and signed by the owner of the rights or an authorized agent. So again, going back to the parcel aspect, if you want to give somebody, you have your existing rights, uh, you've, you've filed your, you, you own copyright from the beginning, perhaps you've registered, perhaps you haven't. But in any event, you own the copyright as the original author. If you want to give somebody the authority to take your image, for example, and put it on t-shirts, you really need to put that in writing and you both need to sign that. At, at the very minimum, it has to be signed by the copyright owner. Otherwise, it's not necessarily an effective transfer. Uh, ownership. So the author is the creator of the work in general. And that, so uh, if you're a painter, uh, you are, when you paint your image, you are the author of the work. You are the instant, at the moment of creation is when a copyright ownership attaches. So as the author, um, if you are the creator, uh, those aren't necessarily interchangeable, but for to start, let's start with creator. If you are the person who creates the work, you are the, considered the author and all the rights attached to you. Whether you register it formally or not, they are attached to you. With joint works, you may have two people creating something. Uh, with joint works, the presumption is that you share equally. Um, if you do not want to share equally, for example, say you're a musician, you're in a band, and two of you come up with a song. One of you wrote the lyrics, one of you wrote the melody, uh, but you feel like one person did about 85% of the work and the other person did 15. If you don't specify that in some sort of writing, then the presumption will be that you share it 50-50. So just note that. Uh, likewise with collaborative works. Uh, with collaborative works, which can include, for example, um, uh, an anthology. If you have an anthology, the person who creates the antho the anthology itself has its own copyright, but each individual work has its own copyright as well. So uh, if I contribute a, story, a short story to a anthology, the person who put the, together the anthology has a copyright ostensibly in the whole work. But that does not dismiss my copyright in my individual story, unless I execute a separate agreement. Okay, let me just pause here for a second before I get to work to hire for hire, and see whether everybody's following along. Any questions? Uh, clarification questions. Um, okay, so Monica Washington asks, how do you establish individual level of contribution in the copyright process? Just a written agreement? Yes, written agreement cannot recommend it enough because the thing is, the presumption is going to be 50-50. Uh, if you just file it, if you file and we'll talk about we're headed this way, but if, we, if you talk, um, when it comes to the registration process, there's sort of these default provisions which are, they assume, the assumption will be if you don't specify that it's 50-50. So I, I highly recommend that you make the agreement between yourselves if you're doing a collaborative work and you do that in writing, that's how people stay friends. I mean, this is my mantra, but people stay friends with contracts, particularly when it comes to issues. Um, so it's better for you guys to agree to, if you're working on a project with a, per, a part a colleague, it's better for you guys to agree between yourselves and put it in writing, this is the ownership interest. Because if you don't, the assumption will be that it's 50-50. And then you have to fight and disagree and say, no, this is my contribution. And you may not successfully rebut the 50-50. So it's always better to determine between yourselves, and again, in a written, signed agreement, this is what we agree on this interest. And again, that doesn't have to be, even that can be, you can have a situation where, say, you have a band. 
um, and you have somebody who's always writing the music and the lyrics and whatnot, but feels that the other part of the band is a significant contributor. It's better to agree amongst yourselves, hey, you know, you may write this, but we, we're all part of a team, and so we're going to share it 50-50, then to have the law decide that for you. So when in doubt, figure it out amongst yourselves, fight that fight amongst yourselves, and then submit the paper, again, written paperwork saying this is the ownership interest. Otherwise, presumptively, it's going to be 50-50. Uh, are we okay? Uh, yeah. Any other clarification? No, I don't have anything else. Okay. Uh, so next we're moving to work for hire. Work for hire is something that artists should be particularly conscious of. Um, particularly some artists who are, find themselves teetering on the more commercially um, commercially commissioned works, uh, graphic designers, etc. Work for hire is an important concept because authorship usually rests, presumptively rests with the creator. However, occasionally you are either an employee or you've been commissioned to do a work. And in those cases, it is possible for the person who either is your employer or who commissioned you to do the work to actually be the copyright holder, which again, going back to the exclusive rights and the transferability, gives them control over whether it can be distributed, or whether it can be copied, whether you can put it on t-shirts. So this is an important thing to clarify. It also, I have to say, for, uh, for commercially involved artists, uh, not only do you want this question clear, but occasionally it's one of the ways you make sure you get paid. Uh, because essentially you say, it's mine until you pay me, and then I sign a work for hire agreement, or I sign something that transfers the rights to you. But this is something to be conscious of. I would say the key for the work for hire, you should always be conscious of it when you are either an employee or you're being commissioned. And the other key thing, uh, which an insane number of employers and commissioners do not realize, is that you uh, there needs to be an express agreement in writing, signed by everyone, that says that this is a work for hire. If you if that doesn't exist, then it's technically not a work for hire. Uh, there are arguments that can be made, but by and large, this is the requirement. So, so if you ever find yourself in a situation where you did some work and someone says, well, that's work for hire, i.e., I own the copyright and I can decide what is done with it, you need to look at whether there's a signed writing expressly saying it's work for hire. If there's not, it belongs to you. Um, do I, somebody has their hand raised. Let me see if okay. I can figure out how to do this. Oops, it went away. Okay, let me see if I'm... Okay, you can go back. Okay. No, no hand raised? It, it went away, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay, registration. Okay, so I... This is my soapbox. I feel very strongly that registration is a good thing for artists. Um, sorry. Uh, Partly because it's relatively inexpensive, uh, it has incredible advantages. It's one of the only ways in which you can conceivably, as a beginning or moderately successful artist, fight against uh, someone stealing your work who has much more resources in terms of legal fees, etc. So, it's very. It's not required. Uh, you do own copyright without registration. And when I say registration, what I'm talking about is registering with the Federal Copyright Office, U.S. Copyright Office. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Again, it is my soapbox. You are free to challenge me on this, but Bill is one of the few things that gives, in a fairly inequitable situation, which is, God forbid, uh, litigation over infringement, 
it's one of the few things that gives an artist even a chance at fighting. So registration, uh, how? Okay, so you can do an online application, uh, and that's actually the U.S. Copyright Office really wants you to do online applications. It's uh, it's not just the copyright. It's not just copyright. It's various forms of intellectual property, but essentially they want you to do it online. Although, if you are a Luddite, you can do it in paper. And there are certain uh, applications that must be made via paper, and if you uh, hard copy. And uh, if you would like to, please ask me. I'm not going to go into it for time reasons today, but please feel free to send me a question and I can uh, let you know more about that. Uh, but again, the online, they're trying to give you incentive to do it online, lower filing fee, it's faster, uh, you can upload things electronically. Um, essentially, the application elements are you complete the application form, all of which is available on at the U.S. Copyright site. There's a non-refundable filing fee, which depend, uh, varies. It's relatively nominal. It's not too expensive, um, and it, given the advantages you get, it's I think it's worth the investment. Um, and then you have to find file a non-returnable deposit copy of the work being registered. So essentially, the office needs to know what you are registering. Uh, so this is the crux: registration. Why advantages? Again, you do not copyright, you owning copyright does not require registration. Because of, for various reasons that I'm not going to go into here, but have to deal with international treaties and the process of copyright, advance, or copyright law and how it's progressed over the century, you do not need to register to own copyright. But it has very specific advantages that are absolutely critical. Uh, first of all, it's a public record of the claim. Uh, so if you, God forbid, find yourself in court, you've at least got something that may be rebutted in terms of, when I say rebutted, I mean that somebody can prove that they had it before you did. But this is your first, it's called prima facie, and it's essentially your first, the first presumption is in your favor if you've actually filed the claim. It says, this date, this happened, copyright existed as of this date. Uh, before in the U.S. with U.S. origin works, um, before you can file, if someone infringes on your work, before you can actually file a suit, it has to be um, registered. So that's key to know, which means it's not impossible. It's just you cannot, if you find somebody is infringing on your work, you need to preferably file from the beginning so that you don't have to like, be playing catch up, but essentially you need to file uh, before you can file suit in court. Uh, registration, again that word uh, phrase prima facie, but essentially it's first level evidence that you have a valid copyright and anything that's in the certificate of copyright that says you know it was created on this date, this is the author, that's all presumed within five years of publication. Um, that's all presumed to be uh, legitimate and factual, and it can be rebutted, which means somebody can prove, can offer evidence to prove that 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 they had that they had the copyright before you did, but you start off on that ground. This is the magic. I cannot stress this enough. Statutory damages and attorney's fees are available to copyright owner and co uh, court actions if uh, sorry, are we still there? Um, in any event, statutory damages and attorney's fees, these are absolutely critical. I cannot stress this enough. If you are going, if uh, Urban Outfitters decides they like your graffiti post, or you know, like they like some picture you put up somewhere. You're painting, like tagging, whatever. And I mention Urban Outfitters and graffiti for a specific reason, because Urban Outfitters has had several cases on this front. But essentially, 
if you haven't registered within three months after publication of the work or prior to infringement of the work, if you haven't registered, you get actual damages. Now what actual damages are, are you have to prove that the person, the other person's infringement affected you financially. And to do that, which is difficult if you're an up-and-coming artist, you need to show that your, worth, your work is worth X amount of money, um, that the fact that the person used your work has financially affected you, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very expensive, you have to hire experts, et cetera. <coughs> if, however, you have filed, not only do you get to go for statutory damages, which means that what the court will look to is what's the fault level of the person who infringed. Like if they find infringement, rather than you having to prove how much your worth is your work is worth, <coughs> the court will look to did they infringe, how culpable are they for the infringement, and then there's a range from five hundred to thirty thousand. Essentially, I'll, I'll double check on this one. <coughs> but essentially, rather than you having to prove I am like an up-and-coming artist and my work is worth X, Y, and Z, which may be very difficult if you're an up-and-coming artist, you just need to prove infringement. And then the court will decide how blameworthy the other side is, and that decides how much money you get per infringement. This is it's hard to explain how much of a savings that is for you because um, experts are expensive. Um, but it's also, it makes, it's a much easier battle. The other thing is attorney's fees. Excuse me. If somebody infringes on your work, and you go to an attorney. Attorneys, particularly in the U.S., can be anywhere from like say a hundred, and that's very cheap, to a thousand dollars an hour. If you go to an attorney and you want them to take your case, it's much easier to get an attorney to take your case on a contingency basis if you can say, "I can recover attorney's fees," because what that means is. If you win, if you win a hundred thousand dollars, for example, if the case goes all the way through, if you win a hundred thousand dollars and attorney's fees are added to it, then you have a hundred thousand dollars, and then whatever your attorney charge gets tacked on as part of the of the payment of the settlement or not settlement. I'm sorry, the, the decision. If you don't have attorney, if you don't have the ability to get attorney's fees, essentially your attorney's share comes out of whatever you recover. So rather than a hundred thousand plus attorney's fees paid by the other party, you're in a situation where attorney's fees may come from your hundred thousand dollars. Well, copyright litigation is extraordinarily expensive. So if it's seventy thousand dollars of attorney's fees, and you only win a hundred thousand dollars. That means your attorney gets seventy thousand dollars, and you get thirty thousand dollars. It is much better to be in a position to say, first of all, to get an attorney to take the case by saying, your fees will be on top of this. It's possible because I did this; I registered beforehand. But it's also um, your recovery is much higher. So that is, I think, the be-all, end-all of why registration makes total sense. Statutory damages in attorney's fees. And uh, please feel free to ask me questions about that. I uh, have two fine. questions from the audience. Do you have one? Sure. Okay. One is, who owns the copyright of a student work created in a university setting? That's from Lisa Mims. The student. Should be the student. Okay. And the I've second one is... Like something in writing. Um, but like, yeah, that situation should be the student. Um, is can you address what publication means to the visual artist? To the visual yes. Artist? Um, let's see. Hold on just a second. That's from Gina Bros. Okay. 
And that's an excellent question. So publication is generally understood as the offering of the work for sale to the general public. Um, there are slightly different, uh, depending on what's involved, uh, publication can be. So, okay, so theoretically, so that's a general definition. Once you offer something for sale to the general public without restriction. Uh, so theoretically, you could have a show of your works where the works were not offered for sale and they would be considered unpublished. However, they are offered for sale, they're considered publication. Uh, does that answer the question? It, it, it can get a little bit more complicated than that, but for the art purposes, I think that's... Uh, please follow up with me if you want more of a nuance, but that as a general rule is it. Okay. The next question... Oh, she said, can you provide a link to that definition? Um, uh, yes. Um, so like, I'll say I'll do that after the webinar. Yeah, the next question yeah. is from Ryan Federson, which asks, art colleges tend to claim non-exclusive copyrights in their handbooks and their admission documents. Are those not valid? No, no, no. Non-exclusive copyrights, definitely valid. Uh, essentially, um, with that, if you say non-exclusive copyright, uh, it is giving, it's giving, oh, actually, let me read the question one more time just so I'm clear before I start. On yeah. The Art colleges tend to claim non-exclusive copyrights in their handbooks and in their admission documents. Are those not valid? So you uh, said those are for that students, um, the question was do students work, what they create in the university set setting is it their copyright and you said yes and so this question is following up saying some places have you signed that they own it. Okay, so a non-exclusive license is not an ownership. Uh, it's important to understand that. Um, a license essentially is permission to use. So an exclusive license would be, um, as a copyright owner, if I give you an exclusive license to my painting, for example, that means even against myself, you are the only one who has the right to use. If I give you an exclusive license to reproduce or distribute, etc., even against myself, I've transferred the ability, my exclusive right to do that to you. If it's non exclusive so uh, the university, if I transferred, if I did a student work and I gave you an, ex and I gave the university an exclusive right to reproduce, etc., that means even against me, the university has the right to reproduce it, do whatever they want with it, sell it, etc., put it on t-shirts, don't ever do this, yeah? Unless you get paid a lot of money. But if it's a non-exclusive license, essentially it means that I can use it, uh, I, the, I, I can use it as the creator. Uh, the university has the ability to use it for maybe promotional efforts. Um, the nature of the license is important because, again, it's like, uh, it's, a, it's a parcel of rights. So you can, you can say you can have the right to, it gives you quite a bit of freedom in terms of the original author and licensing agreement. You can say you have the right to put it on t-shirts, but you can't sell reproductions that are uh, like posters, for example, just being petty, yeah? Mm -hmm. But you can dictate the use of it. In terms of a non-exclusive right, Non-exclusive right means that I can use it as the author. I can sell it to someone else as long as I don't sell them an exclusive right. Uh, so I could license it to Bumbershoot, for example, and Cornish as long as it's non-exclusive. If I give Cornish an exclusive right, then essentially what I've said is that against myself, uh, like I can't use it for t-shirts, Cornish can use it for t-shirts, I can't use it for t-shirts, and I can't license anyone else to use it for t-shirts. 
keeping in mind that this is uh, for a period of, uh, this is a term thing as well. So you want the extent of what they can, in a, a transfer agreement, it's the extent of what can they do with it, um, how long can they do it for, and who else can do it. Uh, does, that, does that answer your question? I think so. Um, I'll see if they, but I think you were really thorough with that one. Um, you have two more questions. Um, the next one is, can the music arrangements be protected under copyright? If so, how does that work? That's from Javier Montilla. Okay. Yes, yes they can. Uh, you um, Copyright, okay, so I'm going to recommend everyone, and I'm sorry this attachment didn't come through, but you, it will be available. Uh, essentially, I have a link of resources, but one of them is to the U.S. Copyright site, which uh, is phenomenal. It's designed for... Uh, even the lawyers use it all the time. It's also designed to help lay people. Uh, so you'll find publications that explain very basic principles of how copyright works. But uh, one of the things you'll find is that there are different applications for sound recordings versus a visual art, uh, depending on the type of work you're trying to copyright. Uh, you have different applications. But music, yes, is copyrightable. Um, you have publishing, so the lyrics, uh, but you also have the sound recording, so it's a bit more, again, I was focusing on visual arts for this one, but uh, if you have follow-up questions, please feel free to send me them directly. But yes, music is copyrightable. The next question is from Akiko Jackson. If original mm -hmm. work completed were in 2009 with a written thesis copyright serving as publication exists, does the artist have prima facie if yeah, face derivative face. works <laughs> were created created by someone in 2015, 2016? Do you want to read that again? Ooh. Oh, yeah, please. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. If original works completed in 2009 with a written thesis copyright serving as a publication exists, does the artist have prima facie if derivative works were created by someone in 2015, 2016? Yes, the presumption will be, um, oh, let me, I'm just, sorry, I'm just checking time because I want to make sure I cover fair use. But um, yes, if it's your original work, the presumption will be that it's yours and that you have the exclusive right to do derivatives, like uh, new additions, for example, particularly if you were speaking like of a thesis. Uh, for variations on that, that would be re reproductions. And yes. So... The, there are arguments that can be made that we'll get to in terms of uh, limitations on the exclusive rights, but the first assumption is that if you did it, if you created it, uh, even if you don't register it, uh, particularly uh, particularly with an academic work where you know you're you're submitting it for a thesis, there's a date that's recognized, etc. The presumption is going to be that you have the copyright and that derivatives are, are or reproductions are illegitimate absent some sort of argument like fair use. That's great. So you do have more, uh, but I'll let you finish and then I'll jump back into the question portion. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, copyright defenses and limitations. I just wanted to cover this because uh, fair use is something that people talk about all the time and have the worst understanding of. It is the Bermuda Triangle of urban legends of copyright. Uh, you often hear people say, well, yeah, you know, if I only use 20% of a song or if I use 10% of this work, there is no formula like that. I'm just here to tell you. There is, there is a test, uh, okay, so fair use. Fair use is a limitation on the author's exclusive rights and a defense to infringement claims. There is a four-step balancing test. Okay, anytime you see four-step balancing test, that is something that happens in court. I'm just here to tell you. So anytime, if you are thinking about using someone else's work, it doesn't mean you can't. Uh, so the class, uh, there's some classic examples. Uh, Shepard Ferry, the use of um, an AP photographer's work for the Obama um, poster. Uh, uh, they settled that, but 
for example, that was a claim of he said fair use, the others, uh, the AP argued infringement. Uh, because you have an underlying work with copyright, which is the underlying photograph. And then he takes it and he adjusts it and he puts some paint and he does some different things, right? There are urban legends that say if you adjust it by 10%, you're safe. This is bullshit. I'm just, sorry for the language, but that's bullshit. Never trust this, yeah? What you're seeing in front of you with this fair use thing, this is what it is. It's a four-step balancing test, and again, balancing test means court, yeah? So that's already expensive. Uh, but what you, in terms of like reality and how do you function, if you, particularly if you're making commentary on existing works, etc. If you're making commentary on existing works, first identify whether or not that work is still covered by copyright. Uh, it may be in public domain, it may not be. Um, it may be fair use or parody, it may not be. But you have to make that first determination. Uh, in terms of fair use, you have this balancing test. Uh, first is purpose and character of the use. Uh, is it commercial versus is it educational? The court's going to be a lot more sympathetic to a, a, a library uh, reproducing, you know, and they're not that sympathetic to the library, but just as a given, they're going to be more sympathetic to a library uh, reproducing an image to share with students to teach something than they are going to be with you taking, uh, you know, uh, a contemporary artist painting and putting it on t-shirts. Uh, so that's one equation. Uh, the nature of the copyrighted work is that uh, Is it a painting? Is it in terms of what's the what's the? Is it a photograph, etc.? Uh, amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. This is where people get bogged down in the urban legend. This is this is a factor. There is no court that has ever said it's ten percent or it's twenty percent equals amount and substantiality. So you, as an artist creating a, a derivative work or taking, or whether it's appropriation art or commentary or whatever, you as an artist have no guarantee that a court, if you are challenged on this, is going to say that's kosher. It doesn't. It says a mountain of substantiality. That's something the court will consider, but they will consider it on a case by case basis. There is no ten percent nonsense. And then. Also critical is the effect of the use upon the potential market for or the value of the copyrighted work. There are two things that the courts have traditionally looked at in this equation. They are whether the work is like two, I mean, they look at all four, but two of the critical, critical things in the last 20, 30 years. And then whether the work's transformative, i.e., do you take an existing work and add something to it, whether it's commentary or a different take, etc. And then also, what is the economic effect on the underlying work? Are you destroying the market for the underlying work? These, I would say, are the two critical, critical factors. So if you are thinking about using something and making a fair use argument, all four of these things come into play. There is no guarantee. There is no percentage you can hang your hat on. Uh, with music, for example, sometimes you hear, well, as long as you use three bars, you're fine. It, as long as it's not more than three bars, this is all nonsense. It all comes down, if you get sued, it will come down to a court balancing this test. The two critical things, I think, in making your own assessment are these last two factors whether or not you've actually contributed something. Are you, it, are you just putting an image and just you change the background from, you take a photograph, for example, Richard Prince, uh, you take a photograph and you just change the color, or do you actually, you know, are you adding elements to the picture, uh, which gives it significance? And then the economic value. Are you destroying the underlying, do you hurt or hinder the underlying artist's ability to achieve economic uh, benefit from their work. Uh, questions? Are you ready? Okay. Yeah. Um, 
So let's see, the next question is, with respect to sound slash songs, how much can an artist sample of another original work without needing permission, which is what you just actually covered. Um, that was from Kelly O'Brien. Um, so there really it sounds like there is no magic number that you can sample. No, there, there is absolutely no magic number. Um, and there's some decisions uh, recently you're getting back. I mean, there's some things like, uh, I think Blurred Lines came out. There's some really hard criticism of, there's three or four recent decisions concerning music, which I, I will admit not doing it on this one, uh, or not prepared to dive in depth in this uh, circumstance. But essentially, there is no there is no equation. Um, you cannot count on, and there are some recent decisions that many copyright lawyers are actually fairly critical of because they feel that it went too far in saying that there was infringement. Um, or that there wasn't fair use, but this is a minefield. Um, it's interesting because one of the main cases, so the transformative use, uh, comes from a two live crew case, which is very famous. Uh, and probably half of you, or if not 90% of you, are too young to even remember the song. But it dealt with Pretty Woman. But what I thought was, what one thing striking about that is that uh, they used, it was found to be, and we just switched to parody. Um, parody, just touching on this, parody is the same analysis as fair use, but one of the things they're looking for is whether there's a satiric or comic effect, uh, as opposed to, uh, uh, so Two Lives Crew, Two Live Crew's song Pretty Woman would be parody, because it's kind of making fun of the concept, whereas uh, Shepard Fairey's Obama picture would be fair use, because it's a little bit more it doesn't have the satiric effect, for example. But the same analysis going on for both. But I guess one of the things I thought was striking is you hear people say often it's better to ask for forgiveness than it is for, for, to ask for permission. I totally oppose that. I think ask for permission. It doesn't kill you to ask for permission. Maybe you get asked to pay something. Um, but as I understand it, uh, Two Life Crew actually tried to pay to license the song and were rejected and then went ahead with parody and they won. So it, it doesn't hurt to say, look, can you know what would you charge me to license this or is it okay if I use this work? Again, other lawyers feel totally differently, but I, I do not subscribe to this. It's better to ask for uh, forgiveness because forgiveness forgiveness may find you in litigation. Uh, let's see, okay. Um, let's see, let me just check for questions. You have a couple, so I didn't know if you wanted to, we have like yes. six minutes left, maybe people can stay on for an extra minute or two, but the next question was, can you register work 10 or more years ago? Uh, yes, so you can. The, okay. So you can register at any time during the life of the copyright. Uh, and life is, I'm sorry, should have been this earlier. Life is currently, um, it is, in terms of public domain, and this is part of the, uh, the handout attachment, so um, we'll follow up with this. But essentially, the easiest thing to know is that with modern copyright since 1978, it's like if it came into existence of um, 1978 or pat or after that. Essentially, it's the life of the author, the creator, plus 70 years. Okay, life of okay. the author, the creator, and 70 years. So yeah. then the next question is: Is it still protected by copyright law if you do not have a watermark on an artwork? It's still protected yes. by copyright. Yes. yes. So let me stress that. Copyright, you don't have to um, notice, notice uh, there's a lot of things that used to be required by copyright that are no longer required. So it used to require like the little C you see next to um, certain things, where it says the little C in the circle and it says the date, et cetera. Uh, date, uh, date C, a little C, and the name of the author. That is no longer required. Now that is a benefit for you. You should do that. 
um, because then it gives notice to the public of, yes, this, this is claimed copyright, this is the date of creation, um, and this is the person who owns it, yeah? yeah? So that's the advantage of doing that, and you should, but it's not required for you actually to hold copyright. So all that is required in the modern um, scheme is that at the moment of creation, which uh, at the moment you put it into a fixed tangible means of expression, so that's like a recording, that's like you paint something, etc. At the moment you do that, copyright belongs to you as the author. Unless you have the work for hire situation, in which case a module would be either it's a commission, uh, so uh, a commission with a written agreement, or you're an employee. So for example, if you're a graphic designer, and you have an employment agreement with your employer that says, yeah, basically everything you create during uh, between nine and five belongs to your, then in that case, it would belong to, it wouldn't belong to you. Uh, it would belong to the employer. But in every other case, essentially, as soon as you create it, you don't have to do anything else to own copyright. You just have to create it. Thank you. Does that answer you the question? A, I think so. Um, I'm going to keep going because you have quite a few questions now. So um, the next one is, okay. I've seen events use sign-in sheets or signage to say that by participating slash attending that you're re releasing your likeness for photography of the event. Do these defective types of permissions hold water? Good question. OK, so I briefly mentioned rights of publicity. That wouldn't be copyright. It would be that would fall more into rights of publicity, which is your right to your image likeness uh, signature, and that is a that is a state um, that varies by state by state. So federal, for example, copyright copyright exists on a state by state basis, but when we deal with it in general, for all intents and purposes, we're talking about federal copyright, and there is a federal statute that deals with copyright. Rights and publicity, there is no federal statute. So what you look to is individual states have rules based on like whether or not you can use that. Whether or not it's enforceable when somebody says we get to use your likeness depends on the laws of the state that that is being executed under, essentially, if that makes sense. Uh, so if I'm in Washington and I give permission to that, under Washington's law, that may be enforceable, and I, I may just be out of luck. Um, it de again, it depends on all the state. The states who have it have different rules. Uh, sometimes you have to be famous to invoke the rights. Sometimes you don't have to. In Washington, you don't have to be famous. Uh, you can just say you can't use my image commercially. Uh, but that's a, it's a different, it's a slightly different thing. It's a very, well, it is a different thing. Okay. Okay. Um, so it depends on what the state's law is and then yes. if it says that that so, is okay, that, that type of yeah. relief does give them permission to use your image. If yes. If, it, if it's allowed under the state law. But lots of times, that's the thing is, lots of times you'll get these sort of declarations by people that say, well, we can do this or we can do that, and they aren't necessarily enforceable. Uh, so it is worth, if you object to something like that, don't just assume that because they had that language that you, you can't object. Uh, you definitely want to check on a state-by-state -state basis. And likewise, if you're trying to use that sort of language, um, because you're taking photographs or whatever and you want to be able to use images for whatever, you want to make sure that in the state you're operating in that is that works. It's not a given. The next question is, can you comment on the notion of mailing yourself a copy of your original work in order to prove copyright? Horse hockey. Uh, no. <laughs> it's not necessary. It's one of the big urban legends. Um, it is essentially, again, 
under the current, and I didn't get too into this because there's been, over the last hundred years, there have been like three or four different copyright iterations of federal law, and they've changed. But the most recent one, uh, we came into, we came into, the U.S. came into line with uh, our treaty obligations under what's called the Berne Convention. And essentially the Berne Convention says, again, going back to, at the moment I create, and I fix it in tangible express uh, in a tangible means of expression. I own copyright. I don't have to do anything else. I don't have to register. I don't have to mail it to myself. I don't have to do any of that. None of that is necessary. If anything that was like theoretically an evidentiary thing, uh, like it's a means of proof, although it wasn't it wasn't necessarily required to establish copyright, but people would do it sort of, I think, to establish proof. It's much better. It's much better to just go online and register and pay the thirty to fifty dollars registration fee. Uh, I mean, seriously, if you're mailing it to yourself, registered mail, you're you're getting up there anyway. Uh, that's a cleaner way. It's documented, but no, uh, you do not have to mail it to yourself. That is absolute. It's like the hook of copyright urban legends. Okay, thank. You. So I'm going to try and get the la through the last through quickly for you, because um, I know everybody's probably um, in the interest of time. Um, for the little C copyright logo, do you have to put your name first or date first? Um, you can do um, the Copyright Office has a suggested format, but it's basically not required. Um, it's just a suggested format, and so the typical thing is to put the little c, then the date, then your name. Um, that's that's generally the suggested format, but it's not required. Like so, if you put your name, then a little c, then a date, that's not going to because notice, uh, which is what that's called, because that's not a required element to preserve your copyright. It doesn't matter. Thank you. The next question is, if the infringer creates work that has extreme similarities to sculptural work, how does the original artist request slash demand the infringer to retract all work that hurts the original artist's credibility? Ooh, okay. Oh, okay. So Vara, sorry, we're going super basics, but okay. So there's a Visual Artist Rights Act, and essentially, if you have certain types of art, of uh, uh, limited edition photographs, sculptures, visual arts. Uh, it doesn't extend to um, if you get past a certain number of editions, it doesn't protect them, and it's it's a very limited thing. Uh, but there are what's called moral rights, uh, and one of those uh, they're much more common in the in, in Europe than they are in the U.S. But again, because we joined this one convention, the Burden Convention we had to change our laws a bit to reflect, uh, to bring us in line with everybody else. So essentially, um, Visual Artist Rights Act, if you fall into that category, um, if someone, you have the right to attribution, you have the right to, if someone damages your work, uh, you have the right to say, uh, this is reflects badly on me, you must stop displaying it. You have certain rights. It's not as extensive as it is in the EU, but that would fall under the Visual Artist Rights Act if you're within that parameters. And essentially, what you do is send a cease and desist letter, and you may actually bring uh, you may actually bring action. Uh, go uh, go to the court and say, you know, I want an injunction or I want some sort of damages. I want you have the ability under certain circumstances to demand that they stop displaying the work or that they remove your name from the work. Yeah, and then this. To be um, specific, was if somebody's displaying work that's similar to yours. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, similar to where yours is going to be, you're going to be making a fair use infringement argument. Uh, the first step would definitely be a cease and desist letter. If you see that, you also it's infringe again. You want to as soon as you see something like that, if you have not registered beforehand, immediately you want to register um, because you want to take advantage of the benefits. But essentially, it's not going to be a slam dunk. It depends on 
and I hate to say this, but because it's, it's such a lawyer thing to say, but it does depend. But the first step is to call them on it and also make sure that you're registered so that if you need to pursue legal action, you can actually do that. But a cease and desist is the first. Well, thank you. That was the end of our questions. And okay. we're a little bit over time. I'm really um, sorry because we didn't get to the copyright critiques, but uh, there is a follow-up handout. So. Well, yeah, and um, thank you so much, Cinnamon. You were awesome, and we will be following up by emailing everybody um, today the worksheet. I do think I did attach it, so it should be um, you should be able to access it. But for people who weren't able to, I will be emailing that out. And we did record this today, so hopefully that will be live um, within a week or so. Um, thank you again. Uh, people are saying thank you to you, Cinnamon. And any oh. parting words? Thank you guys. It's great. <laughs> my, it's my very first webinar, so I appreciate your like humoring me, and uh, it was enjoyable talking to you. Um, yeah, and please, um, I have my contact information. I realized we didn't get to the copyright critiques. Uh, I was more concerned with making sure people we destroyed some of the uh, misinformation around actual copyright. But if you'd like to follow up with me, uh, if you find that subsequent handout insufficient, please do. I'm happy to talk to you about it. Yeah, and for more SALT events, um, go to seattle.gov um, backslash arts, and you'll find uh, SALT under professional development, and you'll have a list of everything else we're doing for the year. Thank you. Thank you.